every morning billions of people around the world drink from a cup like this. And one morning, one of us took a spoon and decided to try tapping on the cup. Can we have this slide, please? Ding, 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 ding. It's the same pitch from all over the place. Wherever I tap, it seems to produce the same, same pitch. Can we have the slide? And where is the... Yeah. So wherever you tap, you, see this, you hear the same pitch. And so maybe that's the signature pitch of this cup. And if you take another cup, um, in another circumstances, you too have another pitch and so forth. But now, it occurred to me to tap somewhere else. Those four corners rather than the first four corners. Can we have the camera, please? So you remember, that's what we heard. But now, 45 degrees off. This side, please. Tan, tan, tan. You get a higher pitch. So what is going on? It's not the same pitch from all over the place. Depend depending on your, how you tap you get the higher pitch. Well, it has to do with the handle. Thank you very much for pointing that out. Can we have the camera, please? But if the pitch difference has to do with the handle, wouldn't you have thought, as I thought at first, that this half of the cup nearer the handle and this half of the cup farther from the handle should behave differently? But that's not how the symmetry is broken. Indeed, the point next to the handle and point farthest from the handle give you exactly the same pitch, whereas 45 degrees off, you have a higher pitch. So we have to figure out what is going on. In order to understand what's going on, we have to forget about the handle for the time being. We'll bring it back in a moment. So let's imagine that we have lost the handle. And then we want to figure out why any four points that form a square will give you always the same pitch. And that's the mechanism like this. You see, if you tap somewhere on the cup, you make that point vibrate in and out, in and out. Well, in response, the point diametrically opposite can respond in one of the two ways. It can respond like this, or it can respond like this, in phase or out of phase, as we say. But, you see, this first response is like moving the cup back and forth as a whole rigid body. It doesn't change the shape of the cup, and the production of sound has everything to do with changing the shape of the cup. So to a good approximation, you're not hearing this. That doesn't partake in the, uh, participate in the production of sound. What you're hearing is this response. On the other hand, the cup as a whole wants to stay as incompressible, not to be confused with the incomprehensible, as possible. That is, it doesn't want to change its volume. So when those two points come in, because it doesn't want to change its volume, those points, 90 degrees off, want to escape out. And when these go out, these go in, and when these go out, those points come in. And so you get this lozenge or rhombus shape oscillation, boom, 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 and that is why any uh, square-shaped pattern will produce exactly the same, same sound. Any square will do. Okay. But then, why those four points, low pitch, and those four points, higher pitch? And why is this? In order to understand that, we have to make the handle come back. Let's bring back the handle. You see, we saw, no, no, the camera, please, still. Uh, not, the, not the slide, okay. So, when we excited any of those four points, yeah, which involves this point, yeah, quadruplet of points, it has to drag the handle with the vibration because this point is being vibrated. Yeah? Whereas those four points, when you tap them, you remember how this works. This goes in and this goes out. This goes in and this goes out. So the point exactly in between that is called a node to a good approximation does not move. In other words, as far as these quadruplet of points are concerned, it's as if the handle were not there because it's not moving anyway. So now you have two elastic systems. You can think of them as springs made of the same material, so the same stiffness. But one of the springs is attached to a very heavy body mass, and the other one is not attached to anything. And then you let them go, and what do you hear? The heavy one will go, wee, 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 the light one will go, hee ho, hee ho, and that's the difference of the pitch. Okay. So can we have these slides? So. So far, we understood, figured out how the sound pattern emerged from this cup, and we knew what the cup looked like. But the inverse problem is very interesting. Since we're talking about the pitch, let's imagine that we're in a pitch dark room, so we see nothing at all. But we go in, and we are allowed to tap the cup all over the place, this body all over the place, and record the sound pattern that emerges from that. 
And based on that recorded data, can we reconstruct where the handle is? So can we reconstruct in general the distribution of the mass and the various properties of the, of, the, of the bodies? This is called the inverse problem because in many areas of mathematical sciences, what you do is you set up a model. For example, it might be a partial differential equation or something like that. And then you solve that in order to predict the future, or in order to predict the, uh, explain the behavior of some system. So you're solving the problem forward. Yeah? But in many other circumstances, what we have is a bunch of observed data, and we have to figure out backward in time, so to speak, what caused this observed data. In other words, we want to recover what's un the underlying mechanism from the result, yes? So if you think about it, a lot of human life, and indeed sciences, are concerned with inverse problem solving. It is a very, very important undertaking, and this is one such example. And already this simple example shows that the inverse problem is very tricky. You can't solve it. For example, you probably agree with me that whether you have the handle on the east corner, north, west, or south, you would get basically the same sound pattern because the sound pattern does not see the difference by 90 degree rotation. Yes, because it's all quite, you know, square symmetric. But not only that, you can't tell, tell where the handle is really, up to 90 degree rotation, but it's even worse or even more interesting, you can't tell how many handles there are because instead of having a large handle on one side, you could have two medium handles opposite each other, and you can see that it's still the same symmetry pattern, or four small handles on corners of a, uh, of a square, and you'll get exactly the same kind of thing. Now, if you are being picky, maybe higher modes will encode some other information, but as far as the lowest energy mode is concerned, it's going to be the same thing. So you can't tell which one you're talking about in the darkness. But, as I mentioned earlier, up to symmetry, you can start saying something interesting. And this is a very, very typical scenario in, when you solve inverse problems, when you try to tackle inverse problems. In other words, you have to no doubt by the symmetry, and then you can start working on the quotient space and so on. Okay, so that was the picture. Can we have this slide, please? Uh, the, uh, sorry, the camera, please. And that was what we had when one thing was vibrating, a cup. But now let's increase the degree of, number of degrees of freedom. So here is a suple that I stole, I mean borrowed from a canteen in Cambridge a long time ago, and then a box that I found on the street market in Bordeaux, actually, and this says on, on the cover in Russian, Chai Gruzinski Extra, extra quality Georgian tea, but this has nothing to do with the experiment. Inside, there is a very nice uh, experimental cup, it's a very nice chai in detail about how to brew a good cup of tea. But I just carry around cedar balls inside. One thing you can say about this experiment that is that the, you know, these cedar balls you put in closets and so on to repel insects, it, it smells nice. And you can't say that about many experiments. So you, if you put some of those balls inside and then swirl the cup. By swirl, I mean I'm doing this. I'm moving it parallel to itself. I'm not rotating it like this. If I swirl, you see that the balls circulate in exactly the way that I'm swirling, in the same direction. Nothing surprising. But now, let's increase the crowdedness, change the order parameter, as we say. I'm going to make it the most crowded. This time, when I swirl, the balls circulate in the opposite direction. <laughs> so there was a transition depending on the crowdedness of the ball. With one ball, it goes in the same direction. In two, three, they go in the expected direction. Three is still the same. But at five, there's suddenly a lot of hesitation. And at six, there's a nascent tendency to start going in the opposite direction. At seven, it's very, very clear that they're circulating in the opposite direction, and the eight, and so on. This is really a remarkable transition, and mathematicians and physicists talk about a phase transition. This is not quite a phase transition in a technical sense because there's no discontinuity in partition function, but it is really a model of phase transition. In the sense that what is happening is like a transition from gas to liquid. Why? Because if you have very few of these, basically those balls don't talk to one another. I mean, they're independent particles. And each time they are hit by a wall, that hit imparts a momentum which sends the ball in the direction that I'm swirling. So those independent particles are just obeying, the, doing the bidding of the wall. On the other hand, if you increase the crowdedness, if they become very crowded, what changes is that they are now in contact with one another. And any momentum that comes in from the wall is dissipated among many, many contacts, so they don't really do it much, much good. On the other hand, what is not lost is because of the contact, when one ball rotates that drags the next ball by rubbing 
in the counter fashion. And you see, now, because all the balls are near the wall, the wall rubs against the ball, and this kind of rotation, or if you like the curl, propagates from the wall and goes into the center and takes the entire thing. And that is the transition. So from the linear momentum-dominated motion to an angular momentum-dominated motion, from the translation to the rotation. And that is the, the transition that happens when you increase the crowdedness. And it is very much like gas to liquid. Because you see, gas is basically independent particles, minding their own businesses going all over the place. Yeah, small, small molecules, if you like. But when you have a liquid, liquid molecules are in kind of contact with one another. So they have to sort of, you know, respect one another. But they can slide past each other. So there is still some kind of motion. Yes? So this is very much like the, that transition. And to show you that it is really like transition from gas to liquid, if you keep Lowering the temperature or increasing the crowdedness, it freezes solid also. Okay. Now, that was several degrees of freedom, but now I wanted to sort of talk about singularity. And this singularity has to do with this kind of phase transition. A much more striking singularity is given. Can we have the camera sideways, please? In this thing, which was given to me as a Christmas present by Andy Ruin, a great mechanical engineer in Cornell. I used to go around um, places saying that this kind of thing might exist, but Andy, really a bright guy, uh, produced this kind of thing. And it is his invention. So those two um, heptagons, these are seven gons, I guarantee are made of the same material, same kind of alloy. Also, they are coated the same way on the surface. And they have the same mass within measurable error. They have the same mass. And finally, I'd like to guarantee one more thing, which is that what you see is what you're getting. In other words, the mass within each is distributed exactly as you see this shape. Yeah. So in other words, I'm, not, I'm saying that it's not that there's more mass actually hidden, concentrating in the middle, and the spokes are much lighter and so on. No, no, no. What you see in volume is exactly how mass is distributed. In other words, mass distribution uniform, homogeneous throughout the body. Okay. Yeah? So they look identical. However, if you try to roll one of them, I'm going to pull it toward me. It rolls quite nicely on the table. The other thing, when I try to roll, it refuses to even start. I simply can't make it roll. So I'm going to pull these at the same time. One rolls very nicely, and the other absolutely refuses to roll. And yet they look identical. What is the difference? Now, before you tell me your suggestions and theories about what the difference is, you should bear in mind that whatever you come up with is going to be a very small difference, because after all, we cannot see the difference. Yeah? So you see something looks like the same as something else. But maybe there's a hidden small difference that we have to look carefully at. But you then have to convince yourself that such a small, tiny difference translates into this enormous, qualitatively important difference of one rolling beautifully and the other not rolling at all. So how come a tiny, 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 tiny difference, invisible difference, mind you, can cause a big difference like this? Yes. Okay. Can we have the slide, please? Now, because you're all very nice people, I'd like to give away the secrets for free. <laughs> and let's imagine rolling these things. And the secret is that the one that rolls is not actually a straight heptagon. It's a heptagon where each edge was bulged out slightly to make it slightly round, slightly more convex. Whereas the one that refuses to roll was a straight heptagon. And that difference makes a huge, huge qualitative difference as follows. Suppose that you now try to roll the one that has been bulged out ever so slightly. By the way, that small bulge is less than a fraction of a millimeter, a really tiny, tiny difference. But you see, because it's bulging a little bit, it's like rolling a curved thing. And when you start from one pivot, which is one corner, and you try to go to the next pivot, the thing can sort of go whoop to the next one, while the point of contact transits continuously from one corner to the other corner. So you can do this continuous transition, whoop, so you can roll. In contrast, when you see a thing with the, its partner, which has absolutely zero curvature, so I denoted by epsilon the roundedness, 
Then this is the picture you get. You start pivoting at one corner and you try to roll. But while you are rolling, this entire edge is in levitation because there is no transition of the, of the point of contact. And so it's sort of floating, 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 and there's no contact until, bang, the next point con comes in contact and dissipates the whole energy and kills the motion. And this difference, qualitative difference, prevails however small, theoretically speaking, this epsilon is. Yeah? Now, in practice, of course, the floor, for example, the surface, is made of wood, so maybe it's slightly deformable. And you can imagine, for example, the case of doing this experiment on the carpet. Carpet deforms very nicely, it will hug the shapes of both, and so it will not make any difference. They'll both roll, they'll both stop. But if you do it on a really rigid surface, there is very little deformation. This epsilon can be anything. So if epsilon is 0 0.1, for example, in some units, this one will roll, roll, this one will absolutely not roll. If epsilon is 0 0.0001, this one will roll beautifully, and this one will not roll. If epsilon is maybe 0 0.0000000001, still this rolls, but this doesn't roll. So you have a situation where the limit of this model, as the parameter goes to zero, doesn't behave at all the same way as the model where it is zero to begin with. So you have a breakage, if you like, a discontinuity in the model, and that is one of the greatest challenges and greatest sort of, uh, sort of fields of action for modern mathematicians. It's called a singular perturbation. So here is an example, probably the simplest example that you can see of singular perturbation in nature. The more famous examples include, for example, viscous fluid mechanics and all that kind of thing. Okay. So I'm going to skip to this kind of thing. And let's move on to the next, um, even worse or more interesting similarity. Can we have the camera from the side, please? Every once in a while, you run into people who happen to be carrying around an inclined plane, and uh, you're in luck. And I brought here two jars. Uh, one of them is filled with a beautiful and uh, delicious basmati rice from India. And the other one is filled with beautiful and delicious air from London. And so one of them is full and the other one is empty. Let's call this one and this call this zero, or 100 and zero. And I propose to let them roll down this inclined plane. They roll down pretty fast and vigorously. OK, not exactly the same way because the moment of inertia is doing something, but they roll down pretty fast and more or less at the same speed, you realize. Okay. So what we, oops, <laughs> what we propose to do is to plot the graph. Yeah, of how the rate of descent of these things as a function of depending on how much filling there is inside. So we already have two data points. When the jar is empty, you are rolling very fast. And when the jar is full, you are rolling quite fast as well. So you have two points which are more or less at the same height. What happens in between? For example, when the jar is half empty or depending on your optimism, half full, I mean, is it going to go faster? I mean, what's going to be the graph which, you know, plots the rate of descent as a function of the field. So let's do an experiment first. Here is a jar which is two-thirds full or one-third empty. Okay. Now there are, let's guess, there are, what, three possibilities, right? So maybe it will go down faster than zero one, which were pretty fast to begin with. Or this two-thirds one will go down slower than zero one. Or maybe if you believe in the story of Galileo Galilei dropping two unequal balls from a tower of Pisa and they landed at the same time on the ground and so on, so maybe it has nothing to do with the amount of feeling inside, so there's no point in this experiment. Maybe it will roll down more or less at the same rate, whatever that amount of feeling. So let's take a vote. Who thinks the 2001 will go faster than zero, uh, zero 01? Who wants to go for this? Okay, who thinks it will go down slower than zero 01? Okay, this, congratulations, this is the option that most reasonable people go for. And then, how about those who think that it will go down more or less at the same rate, whatever the amount of feeling. Okay, there are some people who take us. Okay, let's do this. So I let go. And when I let go, it goes down really slowly compared with this. Yes? But not only does it go down slowly, now you are too far from the camera and you can't hear the noise, but there is some noise going on, and that is because inside the jar there is a lot of motion. We'll come back to that. But in the meantime, let's do the complementary, not, I'm not complement you, complement something, you know, with a supplement something, complementary experiment of one third. Now there are four possibilities on there, so maybe it will be the champion and it will go down faster than everyone else, okay, so far. Or maybe it will be the slowest of all, 
Yeah, it will be the most sluggish. Or maybe it will be faster than 0, 1, which were pretty fast, but slower than, um, sorry, the, no, slower than, faster than 2 thirds, but slower than 0, 1. Okay, maybe in between. Or if you have a beautifully symmetric mind who thinks, well, there must be some symmetry between f and 1 minus f, if you see what I mean. So maybe 2 thirds and 1 third will go down at the same rate and indeed one-fifth and four-fifths. By the way, there's already a data point to confirm this. One-half and one-half go, go down at the same rate. So this, this works. So who thinks this one-third will be the fastest so far? Faster than even zero-one? No, nobody. Who thinks it will go down at the slowest rate? Okay, some takers. Who thinks it will go down faster than two-thirds, but slower than zero-one? Uh, so that's the majority, and that's the uh, reasonable option that the reasonable people go for, good citizens go for. And who thinks, um, who thinks symmetrically? So it will go down more or less at the same speed, the same rate as two thirds, one third and two thirds. No, nobody symmetrically minded. Okay, um, one or two people. Okay, so let's do this. Nothing up here and nothing up here. Um, so I'm going to let it go. Okay, watch because you shouldn't miss it. Uh -huh. It stops completely dead. And not only that, even if I try to cajole it, coax it to go down, it really stops. Complete stoppage. Can we have the uh, slide, please? So what is going on? Um, we have to understand why did this uh, 2001 slow down and why was the 1001 immobilized? That part actually can be understood in a very nice fashion. And the concept involved is called angle of repose. You probably have a childhood experience, or more recently, you took your child to a beach and made a sand pile. I'm talking about dry sand, because with wet sand, you can do all sorts of strange sculptures, but dry sand, and you want to make a pile. Okay, I used to do this in the, on the beaches near Tokyo. Now, when you make a dry pile, dry pile there's only so much steepness you can get into the, to the mountain. If you try to make the sand pile steeper, it starts avalanching, collapsing, and then it stops at a certain angle. There is a maximum steepness angle that you can achieve, and that is called angle repose. In case there are granular experts in the audience, indeed, the angle at which the avalanche starts and the angle at which the avalanche stops are slightly different. But for our purposes, that difference is not, not important. So let's talk about one angle of repose. So this is characteristic of the grains. Now, this angle of repose is quite interesting. For example, for liquids, you know, you can make, say, a little hump in the middle of a honey, right? But the angle of repose, if you wait long enough, is always zero because a liquid cannot sustain this kind of steepness. Indeed, if you make a hump in honey, if you wait a few seconds, it will completely flatten out. Even if you have a really gooey liquid, it's going to flatten out. So for liquids, it is always zero. Now, this angle of repose doesn't depend, in, in, it turns out, on the size of the grain. If you have a small grain, large grain, it's always going to be the same angle of repose, provided the grains have the same shape. So maybe basmati rice will be long and thin, and more Japanese rice will be round and the sort of more equilibrated and so on. So that kind of shape of each grain ha has to do with the alpha, which is the, my notation for angle of repose, but not the size. So I'm going to prove to you that the angle of repose of the grains, grains does not depend on the grain size. Here's the proof. If you make a sand pile and look at it from very, very far away, the, well, the grains look small, right? But if you come very, very close, they look very large, right? But it's always, always the same angle, QED. Okay, so it doesn't <laughs> depend on the grain size. So it's quite interesting that already at this stage, you already see the kind of difficulty that we are facing about singularity before. You see, if you're doing the mechanics or the physics of grains on the one hand, and so-called fluid mechanics, the how the various fluids and liquids flow in particular. It's very tempting to think that, well, you just write down some mathematics for the grains, and you take the limit as the grain size becomes smaller and smaller and smaller, and in, in the infinitesimal limit, by theory, converges to the limit of fluid mechanics. But that's absolutely false, because for grains, the angle repose is something finite. Yeah? It, and even if you take the infinitesimal limit of the grain size, it just stays the same angle. But at the end, when the grain size becomes zero, that is when the, you, you have the fluid model, it suddenly collapses to zero. So there's a discontinuity, there's a singularity. So already, this is really a huge challenge. Now, having prepared this, let's imagine we are discussing why two thirds slow down and one third stop. Let's imagine that the jar was pretty much full. Let's 
imagine that this is the two thirds case. In that case, the center of gravity of the grains is pretty much in the middle of the jar. Oh, yeah. All right. As the picture indicates, then, the center of gravity is where the gravity is passing through, but compared with this point of contact, which I denoted in red, and this point uh, is green, so it's confusing, but anyway, so this is red point. You see that the center of gravity is on the downhill side, on the right-hand side in the picture, of the point of contact. So, gravity is pulling down, as it often happens in London, but the effect of that downward pulling gravity is to roll the jar in the downhill direction, clockwise. So that's going to make you roll down. In contrast, imagine that you have very few grains. In that scenario, you can arrange matters so that the center of gravity is on the uphill side of the, center of of the point of contact, which is red. So the gravity is still pulling down. It's a smaller gravity because there's fewer grains, but it's still pulling down. But Paradoxically, although the gravity is downward pulling, the effect of the gravity, it's called a torque, is to roll the jar upward, <laughs> uphill, because it's in the counterclockwise direction. And this can combat the descent and make the whole thing immo immobile. Note that this effect can happen only if this steepness, that is alpha that I talked about, is larger, steeper than this beta, which is the inclination of the, of the plane. And in particular, for fluid or for liquid, this alpha is always zero, so it can never happen. This, if you have a fluid which is, whose interface is horizontal, of course, the, the center of gravity is somewhere always in the middle, which will be always on the downhill side. So fluid, you can never have this. Nonetheless, by the way, this is a digression. It's very interesting to do this experiment with a jar half full of honey and so on. In fact, I use some more viscous fluid. So you put it down, and I thought at first that because the angle of repose is zero, it's going to roll down very, very slowly as the fluid creeps down. Yeah? But that's not what happened. I just watched, nothing is happening. Watched, nothing continues to happen. You know, watched honey doesn't roll it, apparently. So I get bored and go out to have coffee and I come back after 30 minutes and it's moved a certain distance. <laughs> so it turns out that what happens is that you don't have any rolling motion. But then after a while, it goes suddenly stomp, rolls a little bit. And then it stops there for a while. And then after a while, at some random time, goes stomp and so on. There is intermittent motion which appears from this uh, continuous, continuous um, fluid, which is very, very strange. Okay. So that's what the thing is. Now, so if you plotted this graph or descent pace as a function of how full, it turns out that there are two initial data points that we've got, but in the middle, there's a whole basin of immobility, as you saw. Yeah. Now, if you step away to the right from this basin of immobility, in other words, if you sort of feel a little more, this is what we had with two thirds. Yeah? It started going down slowly, but as I mentioned earlier, there's a lot of motion going on of the grains inside. Indeed, if you looked carefully, um, it turns out that on the interface there is an avalanche, a sigmoidal shape of stuff going boom, going down like a wave. Whereas in the rest of the jar, those grains seem to stick to the inner wall of this jar. So it's behaving in the jargon of the technical jargon of the experts, behaving like a viscous fluid. So fluid with a viscosity, a real fluid if you like. What happens if you step to the left towards 0% after all? If it's 0%, it rolls, so you had better start rolling, right? So can we have the camera back, please, from the side? So this is a jar with very, very few grains left. I'm going to get these out of the field of view. And now I'm going to let it roll. But this time, the way it goes down is quite different from the way two thirds went down. This is how it goes down. And it's perhaps a little difficult to see, but you can barely see it actually on the, on the screen. There is no wave on the surface of the grains. The entire, all the collection of the grains is moving as if it's one body and just sliding inside the jar and just being carried along. Yeah? So in this case, can we have the uh, slide please? You have this kind of motion. There is no avalanche, and there is no sticking. The whole thing is sliding and just going down more or less horizontally. So near 0%, the inside 
brains are behaving like inviscid fluid. In other words, this idealized model of fluid mechanics where there is zero viscosity. And I told you how dramatically different between a little bit of viscosity and zero viscosity is. And here is an example where those two regimes, which we know are mathematically absolutely incompatible, the theory of fluid mechanics in viscous regime and inviscid regime, they just can't meet are living within a simple and very single physical system. So this experiment has been done with uh, Nicolas Taberlet, who is a very clever and um, bright young physicist at Ecole Normale Supérieure in Lyon. And we are trying to play with the parameters so as to shrink this basin of immobility and force two mathematically incompatible regimes meet in the middle. And then Mother Nature will have some really tough decision making. <laughs> so we want to see mathematics break and see how it breaks. Yeah, and that's really a fantastic and horrendous kind of singularity. Okay. Changing tack a little bit. Here is, can we have the camera from the top, please? Yet a further, more sophisticated kind of singularity. Here's a bowl made of paper, and it's a traditional Japanese story, Kamu Fu it's called. And there's a hole in the middle. And you know, when you shrivel it like this, you can blow into the hole. And then make it round again. Okay. But there's another way to make it round. I'm going to shrivel it and then start tossing it in all sorts of different directions. Now, when you hit on something in general, yeah, you are trying to dent it. When you dent it, don't you have the feeling that you should make something less round? Yeah? You are going to make it less and less convex. And you make it you know, more and more dented, that is. But look at what's happening to this thing as I try to dent it from all sides at random. As I keep tapping this, it spontaneously becomes rounder and rounder and it becomes a round ball again. So here is one way that we discovered of trying to dent something and then the ball becomes rounder and rounder. Very, very strange. It, it behaves contrary, absolutely contrary to intuition. How does this work? I mean, and by the way, I'm going to report something else that instead of um, tapping it in gravity like this, I can put it on the floor, and I'm not going to do this because it takes a long time, but I can shrivel it completely, and then I can start poking it from all sides randomly like this. Yeah? That surely is a really harsh denting act. But if you keep doing it for a long, long time, nonetheless, this starts <laughs> blowing up and then becomes round again, even if you poke it from all over. So it's very, very strange. Can we have the slide, please? So let's understand, try to understand what this is. This is still work in progress. So imagine that you hit the ball from one side, bang. What happens? Well, the ball is initially a little wrinkled on one side and a little wrinkled on the other side. Let's hit it from the left. When I hit it from the left, the other side puffs, puffs out by recoil, so it becomes smoother. But the left side, which I tapped, becomes super wrinkled because, you know, I wrinkled, over wrinkled, if you like, because I just tapped it. Can we have the camera, please? Can we have the camera? But at that stage, something very interesting happens. You see, this thing is made of paper. So when I wrinkle it and release, you will see what happens. It starts fighting back a little bit. Did you see that? It starts expanding a little bit. It doesn't go all the way. It stops, but it has some memory. It starts fighting back gradually. Right. Can we have the slide, please? So after this stage, the side which became super wrinkled starts fighting back, starts relaxing from the wrinkles. So you see that per cycle, what happened is that, well, the left-hand side was super wrinkled, but then got relaxed. So basically, it became the same wrinkliness as, the uh, is, as in the beginning of the cycle. Whereas the right-hand side got puffed out and stayed puffed out. So overall, I increased the roundedness or smoothness of the thing. And if I keep doing this from all sides, you know, you super wrinkle and then relax, super wrinkle and relax and so on. But the other side becomes round and round. So you get this kind of graph. If you plot the volume as a function of time, so these are times when I tap or then when I hit, you get Hit, and of course, right after hit, the volume dro drops. But then you have a recovery phase, hit, recover, hit, recover, and then you're asymptote into this spherical shape. Now, this kind of thing is quite extraordinary because throughout mathematics, 
There are many, many situations, mathematical sciences that is, where many different scales must be taken place. You know, large scale, medium scale, small, small scale, really microscopic scale, and those different scales are talking with one another. And the typical example is, for example, turbulence in the fluid. In the turbulence, what happens is that there are big, big vortices. You can think about the climate, you can think about fluid flow of any kind, and there are medium-sized vortices and the small size vortices and smaller size vortices and so on. But if the, the vortex is too small, it gets really rubbed all over the place and killed by viscosity, by friction. So how can you make this whole thing sustainable? Well, the largest vortices must give some of the, drop some of the energy to middle sized vortices. And middle sized vortices in turn give away some of the energy down to small sized vortices and so on. There must be what we call the cascade of energy going from large size to small size. And at the bottom, all that energy that came trickling down is dissipated into, into heat and so forth. So somebody must be stirring it upstairs. It can be a human or it can be the sun. But anyway, stirring upstairs and then you can sustain the whole thing. And in almost all, in fact, I'm tempted to say, in all natural physical systems that we see, where you can see multiple scale uh, scenario like this, there is a cascade of energy, information, what have you, from large to small. Now, those people who have studied too much fluid mechanics will know that the 2D model of turbulence has inverse cascade. But 2D turbulence is very, very strange because there's no vortex stretching and so on and so on. It's a very beautiful mathematical model, but we are excluding that from the natural class. So in all natural classes, cascade from top to bottom. But in this paper balloon case, you see what are those scales? Well, there's a lots and lots of wrinkles on a small scale in the beginning, right? And those wrinkles give way to larger wrinkles, so the length of the wrinkle becomes larger, and then larger and larger, they become not, no longer really wrinkles, but grooves, rather, and then sort of irregularities on spherical surface, so the length of the valley became much bigger and so forth. So you get an inverse cascade from the small scale to large scale. And this kind of inverse cascading is extremely rare in nature, and this, you can, see, you can say, is kind of a singularity. Of, of nature. And this is, therefore, a really strange phenomenon on all sorts of levels. Okay. Now, we should end with some kind of music. So can we have the uh, top camera, please? When, does anybody have a coin, please? Thank you. And the more expensive, the better. Thank you very much. So, yeah, when a coin drops, you hear this very characteristic noise, shuddering noise. So characteristic that when you hear this in a pub or in a restaurant, you, you know, ah, somebody dropped the coin, right? Okay, thank you very much. And the, and the, but then um, I brought here a very, very large coin. It's huge and it's very, very heavy. And Maybe you can weigh this and then sort of uh, tell everyone that how heavy it is. Yeah, it's very heavy. It's heavy. Thank you very much. I, I, I will give you some money for this. Uh, thank you very much. And so, because it's heavy, when I launch this, the motion lasts much longer than a normal coin. And because it lasts much longer, you can see many details that you don't see with a normal coin. It's just going by its own inertia. I'm not driving it. There's no magnet. There's no water anywhere. But nonetheless, Something is going faster and faster. But note that because of the uh, covered area, you can see how fast it's spinning. It's not spinning any faster. It's spinning at the sa same rate. But something else is going faster and faster. Faster and faster. It's lasting longer than I thought. <laughs> but if you eventually come to a stop, when it does, please not only see, but listen to how it finishes. So 
something diverged through the roof. By the way, you don't need this uh, mirror. I can do it on the, on the table as well. Oop, at the end, okay. So, what is going on? This toy became rather popular, and it was nicknamed Euler's disc, although, of course, you know, you know there's a principle throughout the sciences that the a name of a phenomenon or a theorem is never the name of the person who discovered it. And that's, this is called Tokieda's principle, by the way. And the, anyway, so the, um, you know, what is this? But anyway, it became very, very popular, and lots of papers were written about 15 years ago, and in particular there was a paper which um, sort of decided to analyze the effect of lubrication theory, that is the air, friction of the air trapped underneath the disk. And many people didn't like this. I think there were teams writing in from California, either UCLA or Berkeley, saying that they conducted the same experiment in vacuum chamber. And of course, because it's vacuum, you don't hear the sound, but they saw exactly the same characteristics, shuddering, stop, finale. And so, but then the, you know, it was counter that, well, actually, that doesn't prove much because as Maxwell in the 19th century knew, it's very difficult to get rid of viscosity of the air, actually. So if you start making a vacuum chamber and pump out more and more air and drop the density, you would think that because the air becomes thinner and thinner, the effect of the viscosity of the air will drop, but it's not the case. The viscosity of the air is almost constant all the way to zero density, and only at the very, very end it drops. And the reason is, if you remove air molecules, of course, there are fewer collisions. So, of course, there are fewer, there are, there's less friction against the air. But each molecule has a longer, what is called, mean free path. So that prolongation of the length cancels exactly the density of the molecule, it turns out, and then the viscosity becomes constant, pretty much. So you have to have a pretty good vacuum chamber, damn good vacuum chamber, in order to see the effect of the viscosity of the air. At that time, I was, uh, I think, a poor postdoc, I'm still a poor professor, in Montreal. And I wanted to do, I had uh, some model of this, and I wanted to do an experiment, but you know, vacuum chambers are very expensive. So I went to a lady's accessory shop and bought this, it's a bracelet. This will have no problem with the air trapped underneath the disc because there's no disc. <laughs> yeah, it's empty inside. Now, it was actually embarrassing to buy this because I started you know, spinning one bracelet after another to see which one spun very nicely. And then some very charming shop assistant came and said, may I help you, sir? <laughs> yes, sir. Anyway, so I'm going to launch this, and I might have to do it a few times, in as clean a way as I can. Here it is. So now you see it spinning. It's like a ballerina who's spinning on her own axis, and she's spinning upright. But this is the first regime, if you like, but soon there will be a transition and this ring will transit to another type of dynamics now. And from that point onwards, or for all intents and purposes, it is, it is like the coin on the disk. Yeah, and you hear the exact sort of the same kind of divergence. Okay, so this cannot be the um, air underneath the disk. So what is it? I'd like to convince you, and I'll show you some analysis, that it has to do with the following thing. First of all, what's the mystery? The mystery is that initially there was a lot of energy. At the end, all is rest, so energy is gone somewhere. Where did the energy go? And then next, as a function of the energy that's been decreased, that that's been dissipated somewhere, how did this diversion occur? So where does, does the energy go? Well, as the disk rolls and rolls, the point of, point of contact goes around round in circulation. But that point of contact is also the point of pressure. So the pressure is moving in a circular, in a periodic fashion, and that makes the whole support vibrate. In other words, it's sending out earthquake waves, or phonons, as we say. And that sort of shaking elastic wave is taking off the infinity and never coming back. So that's going to carry away energy. In order to show you that this is the case, let's repeat the experiment on a good um, absorber of en elastic energy, such as the human body. Can we have the camera from the side, please? <coughs> so you know that a human body, such as mine, was designed by God to withstand all sorts of shocks. And I'm going to do the experiment on this support and watch how long the experiment lasts. Ready? That's it. Because I earthed the system, if you like, through my body to, to the ground. So all the elastic vibration, elastic energy, escaped through my body and went into the ground. So that's where the energy is going. How, can we have the camera, please? Yeah. 
So, that's what's going on. Now, let's understand how this sort of escapes through the phonons or earthquake waves and goes into the, the and diversions of the frequency. Can we have the, um, the slide, please? I'm sorry. We noted earlier, earlier that you know, what was speeding up was not really the spin. The spin was very steady, but something else. And you can actually imagine the motion of this coin as a nonlinear superposition of two things. One thing is spinning, but the other thing is kind of flapping. Yeah? Mm -hmm. And as you sort of spin and flap, you are doing this. Your yeah, point of contact is moving around, around on a large circle on the ground. Yes. So we're going to analyze those two things. And spin is steady, but it's, it's a flapping that's going faster and faster. Yeah. So a good analogy to have is the classic example of a ball bouncing on the ground. Have you played with Super Bowls? And so you boom, 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 boom. It's a very good bounce. But then, you know, each time it bounces a little bit less. It's called the coefficient of restitution. And then eventually it comes to a stop. It's a beautiful example of an infinite series, geometric series, which has convergent uh, finite sum. But anyway, boom, boom, boom. And each bounce is supposed to be an analogy for the flap. If you like, you take this bouncing thing, which is kind of happening at the point, and spread out the bouncing around the circle on the floor. And that is what the flapping is. Okay, so it's kind of one, one dimensional up from the bouncing. So let's follow this analogy. In this analogy, energy, which has to do with the potential energies, you know, how high you are above the ground, is, has to do with the height. But as you know, you know, if you have a drop something, the height is equal to half times g times t squared or something like that. So it's proportional to time squared. But time is inverse of frequency. Yeah? Frequency is one over time. So this is proportional bounce frequency to negative second power. In other words, energy is proportional to negative second power. On the other hand, let's look at this dissipation mechanism, how the energy goes away. Well, it's due to friction and earthquake and so on. I'm going to talk about not the time, but the remaining time to the singularity, which I'm going to denote by T sing. You see, it's called T sing because that's the singularity time when something diverges at the end, but also that's the time when the disk sings. You see, that's so it's T sing. So you measure the remaining time. What's the rate of change of the energy in the remaining time? Okay. Well, if you differentiate with respect to minus t, to t, you get that. But I'm going to now introduce what is called an ansatz. So this is hypothesis, theoretical hypothesis, which you will have to check against the experiment later on. I'm going to hypothesize that the rate of dissipation of energy, the rate at which the energy is being lost to these earthquake waves, is proportional to the flapping frequency. Yeah, that sounds reasonable. So more you, you have flap per second, more efficient the energy dissipation is. Okay. I'm going to then identify this frequency to that frequency, because after all, we have that, uh, that, that analogy. So that connects, you see, the rate of change of energy to energy itself, but with some negative power. And that's a differential equation, which you can solve with, say, high school mathematics. And it turns out, after solving the equation, that the energy to power three halves is proportional to the remaining time. So as you have less and less remaining time, you have less and less energy. But it drops off with this relationship that energy to three halves is proportional to the remaining time. But the remaining time is, of course, again, related to the frequency. So the upshot is that frequency that you hear yeah, decays, uh, in fact, sorry, rises like the remaining time to the singularity, t sing, but to power negative one third. This is a really strange power. So if this becomes smaller and smaller, this is really one over third uh, cubic root. Yeah? So it becomes larger and larger, but to this rate. So a very bright young physicist, another young physicist called Ariel Amir at Harvard University, um, recorded this and took data. Those wiggles, and this is on logarithmic scale, so log against log time against frequency, and this is the recorded data of the sound of that object, this blue. And the red is the theoretical plot, the theoretical curve of the minus one third graph. And you see it goes smack through the data. I mean, you can't get this kind of beautiful data for, for love of money nowadays. I mean, this is amazing. I mean, it's too, almost too good to be true. And by the way, the time is running from right to left because Ariel is from Israel, and of course, in Hebrew, you write from right to left. And anyway, so it really goes really smack through the center. And so that confers the negative one-third law. 
And this kind of thing is pretty universal. For example, here is a very, very strong magnet. And it's so strong. Can we have the camera, please, from the top? Sorry. From the top, please, and not from the side. Yeah. So this is a very strong magnet. So when I release it, it does that. It's very, very strong. They really want to separate, be separated. And when I toss them in the air, you, you hear this. You hear? You hear the rising pitch. And if you record this, the data is not so clean as data for the disk, but it is still negative one third divergence. Can we have the um, slide, please? So whenever you have some kind of singularity that occurs by multiple collisions, so boom, 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 which is small, getting smaller and smaller because you are dissipating energy, but at the same time, dissipating energy means that you're coming closer and closer, so you go faster and faster. And so that drives this divergence of something, typically frequency, the general phenomenon says that it's negative one-third divergence. Okay. We have been playing with lots of toys, and as we saw, toys open up a huge area and huge universe of sort of mathematical explorations. I listed some of the phenomena on the left column and some of the um, themes that came. In fact, most of these are open challenges for mathematical scientists on the right column, and there are more. So from inverse problems to phase transition signal population to viscous inviscid coalescence and inverse cascade and finite time singularity and so on. Yeah, many of these are active areas of research today and some of these are wide open and more. Now, let me end with a, some kind of homily. You see, we scientists and general public and children alike have the impression that science happens in a very, very specialized context. For example, in labs, the institutes, the internet, that's where science happen, happens, right? Or you go to libraries and classrooms with big research grants and you have to have cutting edge proposals and so on. Now, these are indeed, shall I say, institutionalized sort of organ organizations of science, and these are all supremely important. After all, that's where you expect science to come from. If you stand in, in front of members of the parliament and try to justify science foundation, and this is what you, what you say. So you are justified in asking me and asking yourselves, why are we playing with toys when we have all of these institutionalized science? By way of, way of answer, I'd like to share with you a little known passage from Aristotle. Um, this passage um, concerns a pre-Socratic philosopher called Heraclitus. You might have heard it. This is a pantare, everything flows. Um, Guy. So he, Heraclitus flourished around 600 BC, excuse me, and he was one of the you know, stars of science of the time, you know, philosopher, natural philosopher, equivalent to today's Gresham professor of geometry. Yeah? And so and Aristotle tells the story that one day some young people came to see this great scientist, Heraclitus, and of course they are imagining you know, some bearded professor and you know, stroking the beard and so on, and probably wearing a big lab coat and lecturing to thousands of people, disciples, or sitting in front of a supercomputer programming it to do some really complicated calculation and you know, research grants coming in like, you know, like torrents and so, on. And, and so on. But when they arrived at the house and saw Heraclitus, they found something completely different and they were astonished. And this is Aristotle speaking. He says, in all natural phenomena, there is something of the marvelous. There is a story that some visitors once wished to meet Heraclitus. And when they entered and saw him in the kitchen, warming his, himself at the stove and playing with the children, they hesitated. Heraclitus playing with the children at the stove? But Heraclitus said, come in, don't be afraid. There are gods even here. Enaigarkaientausateus. It's been a great pleasure and privilege to address this distinguished audience, and particularly, I'd like to thank Chris Budd, to whose kind invitation I owe this pleasure and privilege. Thank you very much for your company. <laughs>